Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Stephanie Rule, who is uh, co the anchor of uh, our new morning show, Bloomberg Go, which is increasingly covering these issues in their programming, as well as uh, Bill McDonough, uh, author, designer, architect, um, thought leader in our space. So Stephanie and Bill, thank you very much. Thank you so, so much for having me. Bill, thank you for joining us. Uh, it is rare that we get the candid thoughts from uh, such a visionary and thought leader. Um, but let's start with your book. You wrote Cradle to Cradle in 2002. Right. Many said this is an environmental manifesto. It's going to change the way people live their lives and the way they do business. How has business changed in the last decade? Well, I think the parts that are most intriguing in modern life are that we talked about materials going back to nature or going back to industry, so the parsing between what we call biological nutrition and technical nutrition. And this idea of technical nutrition was in something brand new. And the idea of that things could go back to industry forever was interesting to people, but it all, we also alluded to the fact that people really want the services of these things rather than the molecules. You didn't order steel and rubber when you want to wash clothes, you want to wash clothes. And at the time, we said people aren't going to need to own all this stuff because they're not going to, they don't want to own chemicals and materials, they want services. And at the time, people would say, well, these people are, you know, communists. They don't believe in ownership. They don't believe in stuff. And well, now, talking now, about 1980s, 1990s. Yeah. So now we have, you know, people who realize that when you need a car, there's a bunch of ways to think about it. You need, you want, you love. So what you need is Zipcar, what you need is Uber, what you need is a taxi, what you need is a little car. But if you live in New York, you don't need a parking space, you don't need to pay for it every year, you know, whatever. So there's need, and then want, you want high performance, and love is probably an antique you polish on weekends. So it's really about defining what it is that we, we enjoy. And so it is, as we heard, performance, cost, I think we have to add aesthetics. So it's, does it work? You know, can I afford it? Do I like it? But then we can bring in this deep underlying, is it ecologically intelligent? What prompted us to change the way we think and the way we live our lives? It wasn't that long ago when it was the biggest house, the biggest car, the biggest boat, the biggest plane, where people have really changed the way they're thinking and they feel liberated in not owning things. Right. People want to own less and less, and it's not just because they don't have the money. People of all sorts of means are making these choices. Well, by owning less and less and being chained to something, you have the opportunity to experience more and more. So the question becomes, do you want to be locked down or do you want to have a lot of experiences? I think if we look at the history of industrialization, it gets quite fascinating because if we go back to the history of manual labor, man is the French word for hands, is hand labor. And in textiles, that'd be a rug. You know, we used to weave, and then we learned how to knot. Those are Afghan carpets, and they're knotted. And this is manual. This is manufacturing. And then we've now moved to machine factoring, where machines took over the looms. And now we have robot factoring, which is machines talking to other machines, moving things to make things. And it just, this whole digitization is very interesting. And if we look at just this century, right after the Second World War, my grandparents, you know, before the Second World War, saved everything. They composted, you know, you remember that? And then right after the Second World War, what happened? We got planned obsolescence. All of a sudden we said, oh, we got the color marketing group and we have to sell a turquoise this year, you know, because you're out of style and you need a new toaster. So let's pump them out and get planned obsolescence. You're out of style, it doesn't work, you got a new one, whatever. And that was to churn the materials through the economy so we have this growth. And then I think what's happened in this generation is people realize that that's not happiness. What they wanted was toast, you know, but not the global warming kind. And what we really want is just these services. And now we can see these materials as continuous assets of the companies that made them. That's the weird part. Because what happens in planned obsolescence is you got a washing machine. It was designed to last just long enough. So you felt like you got a value and then it gets to fully depreciated and it's off the balance sheet. When actually, if the company providing washing is providing a washing machine, you're getting a cost per wash, which is a quarter of what it would be if you owned the machine. You're not unhappy. And guess what? The company still owns the metal. It still owns the copper. It still owns that. And it's on their balance sheet as an asset. 
Because what we realized is that when we write this stuff off in a linear economy, we write it off as if it went somewhere. And yet, if we're going to have abundance, we, want to, we really want to put the re back into resources. That's what's going on with circular economy. You look at companies like Airbnb and Uber and say they came about because they filled an emptiness. Right. Was it an emptiness or really are we just shifting business? Because Airbnb this week just said they're responsible for bringing $6 billion to five cities. Well, there weren't suddenly millions of people visiting New York and L.A. and Chicago that hadn't been before. They were just staying in Marriott's and Howard Johnson's. We're just shifting where they're staying. So are we really creating new business or we're just moving it around? Before well, there was Uber, we still got places. Yeah, but I think, let me find a data point since this is a business conference. Um, and I, you know, we checked the numbers, but it was something to this effect. The year before Uber, San Francisco, $250 million taxi business. The next year, a $200 million taxi business and a $2 billion Uber business. So what happened? Personal people mobility in cars, yeah, and people take, getting home safely, You can never I guess. go out in San Francisco until Uber. Right, right. See? It's true. So it's mm -hmm. good for everybody, right? Yeah. It's more fun. But the point being, there's $2 billion worth of new mobility, roughly, being brought to the city for people who wanted to get around, and it gave people a chance to sign up for their own jobs when they needed them, and they used their cars that are parked 95% of the time otherwise. And all of a sudden, for a lot of people who would have had a car, Maybe they don't need a car now because they have this instant math of whether it's worth finding a parking space and spending your life driving around working for cars half the time. Do you have any fears that this new economy isn't regulated enough? It hasn't been tested enough. There's so much excitement and enthusiasm around it. Bad things could happen and we haven't thought about them yet because we just love the fact that there's an Airbnb you know, waiting for us to stay there and it's less expensive than a hotel and it's a better experience. You know, one of the reasons hotels have so much checks and balances or there are re there is regulation around so many industries is because there needs to be. Like, is there a risk we are in this over-enthusiastic bubble about the excitement of the gig economy and the sharing economy and we haven't thought about all the risks? I'm sure there's always risk in these things, but I think that's where principled innovation comes in. And I think that's what, just, that mean? what I mean is if you if you work from your values to value, it's different than working from value to benchmark. So instead of just saying I have number and then I have tactic, strategy, goal, you can never get to what is good and what is bad. And I think that's what's really interesting. So when you actually look at society's job, we realize that the culture is meant to express what is good, what is bad, and understand that, and then develop principles of behavior, visions, goals, strategies, tactics, metrics, value creation. And so when you look at some of these things, you know, we should express what we care. Society's job is to express what they see that matters. And it, this does require immense humility because this, this will be, disruption will cause turbulence, no question about it. Why now are we starting to care about making ethical decisions rather than strictly business decisions? Because as far as publicly traded companies go, I have never visited an investor day, an analyst call, where CEOs are being pressed or asked about making ethical decisions. They need, they in the past are pushed to make decisions that benefit shareholders. So where does that balance come? You know, we love holding up that picture of Blake from Tom's Shoes and saying he's so cool and he does the right thing, but that's a one-off. How do we get more companies to start behaving in that way? Because that's not what's asked of them at the end of the day. Yeah, I think that's a really key point. It's like, what are we measuring? And I think the, the CEOs that I get excited about are the people who recognize that short and long-term value are consistent. And that if you think about it, the apple is currency, the orchard is capital. One more and time. The apple is currency, you eat it and it is gone. And the word itself betrays the time frame. It's current and poof, it's ephemera. And then you've got the orchard, right, which you're leaving behind for the next generation. But it's generating the apples for your next season. And that, for a business, is a critical issue. And a good example is someone like Warren Buffett at Berkshire Hathaway. OK? Think about this. When, when we designed new carpet, what we said, and he bought Shaw Industries, and we worked with Shaw. And we looked at their carpet and said, you know, really, that's a service you're selling the customer. What they want is appearance, comfort, acoustics, cleanability, 
whatever. They don't want the molecules. They want a carpet underfoot. And when they want to change it, they want to change it without guilt and without extra cost. What if you think about this as redesigning the carpet so it's infinitely reusable and it's yours and you're essentially putting it on the floor of the customer, staying in touch with them when they want to change it, you're cheaper than the other people because you've just stored your raw materials on their floor. So all of a sudden we have one and a half billion pounds of carpet waste in America that becomes carpet again ad infinitum and we don't have to go mine it, we don't have to go look for it, we know where it is and you're in constant relationship to the customer and if business has any job, if there is a job for business that represents both value and values, it's job number one and the less bad scenario is, you know, job one is don't kill your customers, that would be good. Uh, and secondly, why not produce value consistently for your shareholders? It is now the largest carpet company in the world. Why is business ahead of government? You know, in theory, we think of business people as these big, bad titans who only care about profitability. But as it relates to sustainability, uh, socially conscious impact, we think about CEOs like Paul Pullman of Unilever or mm -hmm. Richard Branson. But our own government, I mean, a month from now, we're going to have the Climate Change Summit in Paris, and it's so important to world leaders. But you've got the state of Florida, where, po where political leaders in Florida, some of them don't even allow the term climate change to be used in their offices. So where is the disconnect? How come business leaders and private citizens are understanding, embracing, attacking uh, what, what ails us with regard to climate change, and our own political leaders aren't? Well, I think business has to lead uh, change. Business, commerce is the engine of change. And, and the government and the regulators and politicians will follow business because business is faster and far more creative. There will be a point when the political leaders in Florida are saying all this you know, up to their ankles in salt water, and that'll be interesting to watch that happen. But if you, if you just look at what business can do, what Paul Pullman and Branson are talking about is innovation. That's what they're talking about. And this is principled innovation. They're saying we are going to be able to use this as a platform for change. And as you do that, once you innovate into it, it's cost, performance, aesthetics, and ecological intelligence all together, and you make stuff that's cheaper, faster, people love it more, and, and et cetera. You can't give up on the quality of life here because you're selling products to people that they enjoy and are ready to give you their money for. So this is an innovation engine for people, and that's where it disrupts. That's what disrupts, is that it's, we innovate, we do things that are just more attractive and cheaper. What is the catalyst that got us here in terms of innovation? Is it technology? Because I personally hate to give all of this credit to millennials. I mean, it's so we just think they're like the coolest, smartest people that ever lived. Is there something so special about the way they think and the way they live their lives? Or is it technology that's brought us to this place where we're actually caring a whole lot more? Because neither Paul nor Richard nor you or me are millennials. <laughs> yeah, but I was in, uh, I graduated from high school in 1969. All I can say is that the summer uh, after I graduated summer from high school, 69. 69, I went to Europe <laughs> and uh, we saw Neil Armstrong land on the moon. And if you think about this for a minute, John Kennedy got up and said, we're going to the moon and we're going to be there in, in less than 10 years. He did it because we had an identity crisis in the United States, because Yuri Gagarin went around the Earth first. He was Russian, and, and that was a problem. So we got there. It's interesting to know that NASA, we just designed NASA's space station on Earth, which was fun, by the way. And if you think about it, they, we went and landed on the moon in nine years. The average age of the NASA team that put Neil Armstrong on the moon for the United States was 28 years old, which means when John Kennedy got up and said, we're going to the moon, guess what happened? A whole bunch of 18-year-olds stood up and said, we're going to the moon. And they did. Bravo. You know, That's what we do. So where are the 18-year-olds? Oh, guess what? You know, welcome to aggressive, ambitious young people. Go figure. <laughs> this is what we do. What do we need to do in terms of climate change? It just seems still so bifurcated and it's hard for people in places in, in the developing world where we're affected by it less. We're really affected by it in places where there isn't political and business leadership, right? In places like the Maldives, when I worry, what's gonna happen there? Who's gonna help that place? When I think about 
Cocos Island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean where there it's in theory internationally protected waters that no one is protecting. How are we going to globally actually protect this world and have an impact? Because at the end of the day, we make our voting and business decisions based on what's happening in our lives, in our back door today. But there are global ramifications that could affect us today, our children tomorrow. How do we actually get people to make those kind of decisions? Because they're expensive. Yeah. Well, the, I think the first thing we have to do is, is stop demonizing carbon. Carbon is a very essential thing. You and I are both carbon, basically. So if we hate carbon, we should shoot ourselves, drive and blow away. So, okay. So we're not going to do that. So let's start enjoying this. Now, carbon in the atmosphere is a toxin. We don't have lead in our gasoline anymore for a reason. People got up and said, our children's brains matter. And lead is a neurotoxin. And we are not going to distribute neurotoxins along the highway because it's just not OK. We're going to say the same thing about carbon. We're going to look back and say, what were we thinking? Because we're putting the atmosphere at a point where it's highly problematic. Fine. So the first thing is say, carbon's not bad unless it's atmospheric. So then we stop demonizing carbon and say, carbon is fantastic in soil. Let's rebuild the soil. What is oil? Oil is ancient soil. We took the S off, put it under temperature, time, pressure, and it became oil. If we bring it back up, fine, let's use it for durable carbon, for plastics and soil amendments, but release it to the atmosphere? That's about the silliest thing you could do because the design is getting in the ground. So first we say carbon is an asset, not a liability. And the most business-like thing we can do is quickly separate what are liabilities, what are assets. This is what we know how to do. It's basic. Right, math. And then we just say, fine, less of this, more of this. And then we say, where's the business opportunity? And we've just seen the first contracts for renewable power at five cents. That's astonishing. So this thing is coming as a steamroller. We're looking at what's going on in China with renewables and so on and so forth. There's that. There's other clean technologies. And right now, the Chinese announced, I don't know, last week, I think they, they hit 1,500, I think, in, in Beijing. This is the worst air quality in history. And it's like getting off an airplane in Beijing and taking two packs of cigarettes, go sit in a small room and smoke it. That's what it was in Beijing for normal humans walking around. When? Last week. So at what point do we go, uh, let's discover the obvious. Let's move on with this now. And this is where business leaders just, they don't have a problem with this. They just understand. What is, the problem we've had is that people think that being less bad is being good. See, less is mathematical, less more. Bad is the human value, good, bad. But we're not giving people the time frame to be good. We're not giving, when our, our political leaders are in office for four years, business leaders have activists knocking on their doors, board members giving, shouting demands at them, and shareholders. So it's very, very difficult to make those long-term decisions. It's why we look to icons like Richard Branson, who has both the money and the power in his organization to make long-term decisions. How can we incentivize corporate leaders to make those kind of good choices, not just less bad, when they've got, I don't want to say competing interests, but how they feel in their heart and what they want to do opposes the pressures that they're faced with? The, first, the thing we found to be most effective, and this is getting granular, is to focus. Public shaming? No, 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 heavens no. I mean, get rid of the word should and must, because it's just noisy. We should say can and could, and then will. So we are, yes. we are, we are, we can do this. And Leibniz said, if something is possible, therefore it exists. So our job is to make it exist, and then for everybody else it's possible. And if you look at what, we, what happens, you go for the CapEx. This is the, the thing, go for the CapEx, because it's right away. When Ford put the largest green roof in the world on the factory in Dearborn, we saved $35 million in CapEx day one, day one over chemical treatment plants of the water by using natural systems and this lightweight roof that had been invented in, in Germany uh, to camouflage big fighters during the Cold War, which was interesting. But it's a very light roof, and it worked, and everything worked. $35 million, and it saved them $35 million day one. Well, we went into the boardroom and said, we are fiduciaries in the car business. We need to approve the project. So we're walking in here with $35 million in savings. This is the equivalent of walking into the room and giving you an order uh, with the Ford Taurus at a 4% margin out of Chicago of an order for $900 million worth of cars. Do you want to prove this or not? That is shareholder value. That's what that is. And it's day one, CapEx. Wow. So then that's design intention. 
and then you work on the long-term stuff about how do you keep your customers engaged. That's the job of business. So the fastest thing to give the shareholders is CapEx. Focus on the CapEx. And the second is to recognize that the people are the most valuable thing and the relationship is the most valuable thing in your company. When you look at a company like Google, putting solar all over the Googleplex, they don't even own it. And they're paid more for solar energy than regular electricity, a little bit. Why? Well, because the average engineer at Google generates a million dollars in revenue, and they need 20,000 of them. So you get one genius to move from Cambridge to Mountain View. You paid for it. And what are you doing? You're being googly, and you're doing you're doing, uh, you're recruiting against Cisco and uh, VMware and everybody else, and you're solar powered and they're not. It's googly. So they can do math. See where the numbers are. The numbers are in your people. The numbers are in your customers. The number is not in your OPEX and a few cents a kilowatt hour. The number is the inspiration you give to your customers and you keep your business going. And if we remember where the word competition comes from, modern business leaders don't know this. When you ask them, competition is from Latin, competare. It means walk together, forward. That's what it means. And it came from the Greeks after the fighting uh, uh, city-states. They realized they're decimating each other, whacking at each other all the time. The Persians are going to roll all over them whenever they show up because they're killing each other. So they decided to create the Olympics. So they all run around, throw sharp sticks, whack at each other, and get strong and fit. And then the Persians show up. They're all athletes. That was interesting. Competition. That's what it's for. It's to get fit together and then have fun. And somebody gets to wear the laurel wreath, but nobody dies. It's not kill the other, right? It's crazy. So the fundamental question of commerce is about to shift from, and this is where the millennials get it. Sorry, but they get it. Humility. That's why we need term limits so we don't have people in Congress who are 412 years old who don't get this. And we need, but we also need immense humility because you see, designers need humility, obviously. I mean, just remember this. While we're talking about all this, it did take us 5,000 years to put wheels on our luggage. You know, we aren't that smart. We, we went to the moon before... You husband to carry it. Yeah. Um, you know. This it's, is so interesting. You are so interesting. We are out of time. Sorry. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much.